World War II was over. And after nearly four years of sacrifice and uncertainty, Americans happily greeted victory and looked forward to the freedoms of a new era. In these post-war years, the can-do spirit of the war effort shifted to support American industry. But peace at home did not come easily or quickly. The strength of our nation must continue to be used in the interest of all our people rather than a privileged few. New cataclysmic threats were rising from afar, and at home, struggles of social discontent were met with anger. The president and the executive branch of government will support and ensure the carrying out of the decisions of the federal courts. In this era of unparalleled growth and dynamic change, the foundation of modern-day America was formed. These were the post-war years. When the military band played for Harry S. Truman's vice presidential inauguration, it seemed to show more enthusiasm than he did. Truman had been pushed into the position by the Democratic Party. Many assumed that Truman would be another forgettable vice president, quietly fulfilling his duties in the shadow of the popular and charismatic President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But history changed course. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin from CBS World News. A press association has just announced that President Roosevelt is dead. The president died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Roosevelt's death left the nation stunned and uncertain. For Truman, the news was both a shock and a burden. In his previous 82 days as vice president, he had only met with Roosevelt twice. He hadn't even been told that America had developed an atomic bomb. Now, as president, his political mettle would be severely tested. Truman had spent 10 years in the Senate and had made a name for himself by aggressively investigating corruption in the defense industry. He was well-versed in domestic issues, but knew very little about foreign policy. Many thought him too stubborn and plain-spoken to govern the United States. But Harry S. Truman rose to the challenges of the presidency. His legendary honesty and determination gained him respect. He was willing to make hard decisions and take responsibility for them. His motto, the buck stops here. That was never more true than in his order to use atomic weapons against the Japanese. His decision brought an immediate end to World War II. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. Japan's surrender was cheered in the streets. But it didn't mean everyone was coming home. Some troops were ordered to stay overseas to rebuild shattered nations and protect against communism. Public reaction was so swift and negative, Truman reversed his order and called for rapid demobilization. Relieved soldiers were sent home only to find a struggling post-war economy. 10 days after Japan's surrender, one million defense workers were laid off. With no war, the Pentagon rushed to cancel billions of dollars in war contracts. Scores of eager GIs arrived home ready to work, but the jobs at factories and shipyards were already gone. One bright light for returning military men and women was the Serviceman's Readjustment Act, also known as the Montgomery GI Bill. It provided low-interest loans, granted veterans unemployment benefits, and subsidized educational expenses. The GI Bill made a college education available to millions who otherwise couldn't afford one. The assistance dramatically expanded the middle class and served as a catalyst for a tremendous social change. Making good on his pledge to carry on the New Deal policies of Franklin Roosevelt, 
Truman sent a liberal domestic agenda to Congress. He called for greater unemployment insurance, a higher minimum wage, a larger social security system, housing assistance, and for the first time in the nation's history, a bill for national medical health insurance. But Congress had no interest in social welfare. They shut down the president's domestic initiatives almost completely, and the economy continued its slide. By the spring of 1946, inflation was soaring, and three million Americans were out of work. Those on the job demanded pay increases to keep pace. Unhappy with their situation, workers hit the picket lines. In 1946 alone, over 4.5 million Americans went on strike. Their demonstrations were often ugly and violent. In May of that year, union boss John L. Lewis called a nationwide coal strike to secure a wage increase. A month later, the railway struck. With limited transportation, the nation's economy ground to a halt. The president was a friend of labor, but in this instance, he felt railroad unions had gone too far. He took action and made a bold appeal to Congress. I request to Congress immediately to authorize the president to draft into the armed forces of the United States all workers who are on strike against their government. Returning to military duty was a chilling prospect. Before the president could finish his speech, he was handed a note. Word has just been received that the rail strike has been settled on terms proposed by the president. Truman's victory was little consolation to Americans forced to stand in long lines for the most basic necessities. Inflation was out of control and goods were often scarce. In the 1946 midterm elections, Republicans saw an opportunity and squarely laid the blame for the country's woes on the Democrats, and especially President Truman. Republicans won control of both the House and the Senate, as Americans voted overwhelmingly in favor of change. The new Republican Congress was eager to roll back New Deal policies. Republican Senator Robert Taft of Ohio led a conservative backlash against labor in 1947. He co-sponsored the Taft-Hartley Act, which slashed the power of unions. Truman called it an oppressive law and refused to sign it. I vetoed the Taft-Hartley bill. It is bad for labor, bad for management, bad for the country. But Republicans had enough votes to override the president's veto. The Taft-Hartley Act took away much of the influence unions had won under the New Deal. In 1947, Truman became the first president since Abraham Lincoln to make civil rights a national issue. The president was disgusted by the treatment of African-American veterans of World War II. As soldiers and seamen, they had been willing to fight and die for their country. Now they were asking for fair treatment, and Truman thought they were entitled to it. He believed that the government had an obligation to see that the civil rights of every citizen are fully and equally protected. In 1946, Truman appointed the President's Committee on Civil Rights to study the race issue. Shortly afterward, his panel issued its report, confirming that segregation, lynching, and discrimination at the polls had to be ended. And in 1947, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, Truman became the first president ever to address the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. But we cannot any longer await the growth of a will to action in the slowest state or the most backward community. <laughs> Our national government must show the